All faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction or evidence of things not seen. They will speak of the miracle of biblical scripture as a way to gain faith. And then Peter will ask him, you knew this was coming, what do you believe? And I think that this is one of the points, this is why we call this a text a propedeutic, didactic, instructional. Because I think it's true that the reader is supposed to internalize these questions. St. Peter's question, what do you believe in? And put a note to yourself at 3a. Later, when we meet Matthew Arnold in his classic poem, Dover Beach, we're going to hear about this sea of faith that once was two at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But Arnold will say, but now I only hear its long withdrawing melancholy roar. In other words, Arnold's going to argue one of the problems with modernity, and we would argue post-modernity, is the inability to believe anymore. Here, the question, what do you believe? Dante will, of course, provide the creed, I believe in one God, etc., etc. And St. Peter will, at this moment, hug Dante, right? He's passed the test. The crown is coming. Canto 25, the eighth heaven continues. Dante will muse on being a famous poet someday and wonders if Florence will take him back when all of a sudden St. James shows up to talk about hope. That will make sense given what Dante was just thinking about. So now you've got St. Peter and St. James and the discussion will be about hope. Dante, when asked what it is, will say hope is the certain expectation of future glory vis-a-vis -vis God's grace, right? St. John will join them as well, and uh, they will have, um, he will make the observation, no, St. John will say, I don't have a body, only Christ and Mary up here have bodies in heaven, and Dante will turn to see Beatrice, and at that moment, he is blinded. In Canto 26, we remain in the eighth heaven, the sphere of the fixed stars, and Dante is now with St. John. Beatrice says that St. John can cure Dante's blindness, literally, metaphorically. And St. John will ask, what is it that you wish for? What do you hope for? And Dante will say, I desire God's love. And at that moment, a miracle happens. He regains his sight. And then Adam joins them. Okay, Adam is in, the Adam and Eve, right? He will report several interesting things, like, for example, he only got to live seven hours in Eden, right? And Dante will ask, what language? I mean, this was always one of those questions that sometimes gets asked. Yeah, you know, Genesis 1, God speaks the world into existence. Really, what language did God speak? Well, this is the question that's asked, and Adam says, now a dead language, no longer a language that's spoken. Canto 27, the eighth heaven is continued, but now we'll move into the ninth heaven, the premium mobile or the prime mover. All the souls sing Gloria and celebrate the Trinity. Dante seems um, to say he seems like the whole universe is smiling and enjoy. Peter will then all of a sudden turn red, and a whole bunch of everything turns red. And this is about the current pope is so corrupt, is, uh, is, is the observation. Um, and he, Peter, will say that the popes are like wolves in disguise, quoting a, a New Testament passage. Peter will tell Dante that he will help bring the bad popes to justice. The divine comedy is that of tempt. Now, think about the genius of this. If people come after Dante to say, how dare you, especially Pope Boniface, Boniface VIII, how dare you say and do what you're saying about popes, the vicar of Christ. Um, Dante can say, I'm only doing what St. Peter told me to do. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant construction, right? Dante and Beatrice now will ascend to the root of the universe, the prime mover created first, we're told, and this prime mover is God's, uh, is God's mind, right? Time began here, we're told. And Beatrice um, will promise that everything is going to be put right, ultimately. Canto 28, we're still in the ninth of heaven. Dante will see the nine rings of flame, the seraphim, the cherubim, and all of, and all of that. Canto 29, we're still in the ninth heaven, and Beatrice will tell Dante the creation story, which is a fascinating uh, story. God created the world. But one of the questions that theologians had been asking for a long time is, why would a perfect being create a world that ultimately becomes fallen in some way? Two answers. One, God created the world to see himself reflected in his creation. And of course, we will have the second answer, what happened? Well, it gets blamed on Lucifer and other angels who revolt and are cast out by God because of pride. We'll get to this conversation in more detail when we do our Milton and Paradise Lost. And as well, of course, humans had to be given free will, the right to choose to obey or disobey. Beatrice will teach about angels and 
as well bad teachers and bad philosophers. She will point out that there are in fact an infinite number of angels and they represent the infinite ways that God's love is expressed. Canto 30. We'll finish now in the 10th heaven, the Imperium. Dante and Beatrice will ascend to this Imperium, the highest heaven, where there is just pure love. It's so bright that Dante can't see much, and he sees angels and saints all around in God's court. Dante will see the celestial rose, what we, we, we call the multifoliate rose, and Beatrice will predict that Pope Clement V will in fact go to hell. So Dante's not done making these kinds of accusations. Canto 31, the tenth heaven is continued, the Imperium, Dante is inside the rose with the blessed spirits, and he's speechless, again, translinguistic, as we say. Dante will turn to Beatrice, just like earlier in Purgatory, he turned to Virgil, and she's gone. She's in the rose. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux will now lead Dante the rest of the way. A whole lot of ink's been spilled on why, why Dante does this. I think that there's uh, one or two good answers. Bernard was an important Christian mystic, but he was also a poet. And he wrote a lot of great poetry. And I think Dante, in the very end, is somehow wanting to identify his poetic, what would we say, mission, his poetic attempt with Bernard of Clairvaux. Dante will see the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven, and all will adore her. Canto 32, still, uh, of course, in the Imperium, St. Bernard um, will then name some of the women of the greats, Mary, Eve, Beatrice, etc. And then some of those uh, who believed in Christ before he came, St. Bernard will name some great men. This is kind of the Hall of Fame from John the Baptist to St. Francis and Augustine and a whole bunch of others. And then below them we have children saved because of their innocence. And then the discussion about why after Christ came and died, children who were not baptized ended up not in heaven, but rather in limbo. Okay? And Bernard points out the angel Gabriel at the conclusion of Canto 32. Canto 33. This is the end of our study, and we begin with an amazing prayer. And while I apologize that I haven't been able to read a lot of this uh, with you, um, I do want to maybe read just a few lines here um, uh, at the very end of Canto 33. Bernard will begin with an amazing prayer to Mary. I wish I could read it. I don't have time. Dante will then long to see the face of God. This has been what this whole journey has been about. Everyone will join in the prayer on Dante's behalf. Mary will raise Dante and Bernard to the light above, and Dante will then begin to report the impossible, to report what he sees. Dante will express loss of memory, the wind that carries away the leaves on which the prophet, uh, the prophet as Sybil wrote. You'll remember in the Aeneid, uh, uh, we, we played that game. Dante makes a reference there. We see a book. He sees a book. It's bound by love. He, or it's all the organization of the infinite scattered information of the universe is somehow assumed in this book. Dante will see three circles, different colors and sizes. He has a sudden final flash of insight that is an epiphany of translinguistic. And Dante's free will is now finally in complete harmony with God's will. Let's just enjoy the final lines. With fixed heat, suspense, and motionless, wandering, I gazed. And admiration still was kindled as I gazed. It may not be that one who looks upon that light can turn to other object willingly as view. For all the good that will may covet, there is some, and all elsewhere defective found, complete harmony. My tongue shall utter now no more even with remembrance keeps than could the babes that yet is moistened at its mother's breast. It's a beautiful image, right? And obviously Mary has played such a pivotal role. Not that the semblance of the living light was changed, that ever as at first remained, but that my vision quickened, and in that sole appearance still new miracles decried, and toiled me with the change. In that abyss of radiance, clear and lofty, seemed, methought, three orbits of triple hue clipped in one bound, and from another one reflected, seemed as rainbow is from rainbow, and the third seemed fire be breathed equally from both. O oh, speech, how feeble and how faint art thou to give conception birth, yet this is to what I saw is less 
than little. O eternal light, soul in thyself that dwellest in of thyself, soul understood past, present, or to come, thou smilest on that circling which in thee seemed as reflected splendor, while I mused, for I therein me thought in its own hue beheld our image, painted steadfastly, I therefore poured upon the view, as one who versed in geometric love would fain measure the circle, the attempt to square the circle, and though pondering long and deeply, that beginning which he needs finds not, even such was I, intent to scan the novel wonder and trace out the form, how to the circle fitted, and therein how placed. But the flight was not for my wing. Had not a flash darted athwart my mind, and in the spleen unfolded what it sought. Here, vigor failed the towering fantasy, and yet the will rolled onward like a wheel in every motion. But the love impelled that moves the sun in heaven, and all the stars. The beautiful image of the wheel at the very end, and of course, the idea of love. Okay, just to finish now, really quickly with our levels of reading, the major symbols here, obviously light and music, no question, the continuation of the power of art. Another major message, obviously, here and from our very end, God's will, God's love is beyond human reason, which should, of course, lead us to the humility that is so important. One of the major motifs here is, of course, the journey, the longing for God, both the physical as well as the spiritual dark journey. Finally, Dante's desire to share all of this with humans through this kind of a poem and what he has learned brings us finally to ask some important key final questions. Let's come back in a few minutes and let's ask what those final questions are. What is the Divine Comedy about? Thank you.